summer and uh, have some of you come with me. Amen. <clears throat> Book of Ephesians, chapter 6. <clears throat> we're going to move on to a different series here about fighting the fight. And uh, what we're going to do each week, I'll have a different married couple get up and give testimony. And <laughs> fighting the fight. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 19. Let's, uh, let's listen to this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, uh, against the rulers of, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, uh, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, <clears throat> listen, folks, uh, not to be spooky or anything. And, and do I have this? Now? Oh, you're the man, Justin. You're doing great. You're doing gooder and gooder. Uh, not to, to be spooky, but listen, folks, whether you realize it or not, there is a spiritual warfare going on, okay? Now, do I sound okay out there or do I sound loud? Am I a little too loud? I'm a little loud out there, brother. And just turn me, okay, is that better? Right? Base, I'm too bassy. Is it better now? No, okay. Just give me just a little bass. Not that I need much. I've got the man's voice. Danny's thinking of when he's speaking. I'm pretty sure sounding like the chipmunks up here. <clears throat> I'm glad you got thick hide, brother. This is so fun. Listen, there is a spiritual warfare. The, the devil desires to destroy you. Number one, if you're not saved, he desires to take you to hell. Uh, you know, you, you can harm me physically, but you harm me worse if you harm my family. Now, the devil can't get God personally. Uh, God's way too powerful, and devil, uh, God created Lucifer. So how is he going to hurt God? By getting at us. And if he can take someone to hell, then man, he is, he, he's uh, hit a blow at God, he feels. Now, if you're saved, if there's been a time you've trusted Christ as your Savior, well, the devil's lost that. And boy, I praise God that he lost that battle with me back in 1983. I am fireproof, amen. I, I'm on my way to heaven. Nothing the devil can ch uh, do to change that. But what he would like to do now is render me ineffective. He would like to, to um, do some things and cause me to think some things that would take away from my effectiveness for the Lord. And by the way, I'm not talking about getting me to sin in a way that would disqualify me from the ministry. Me discouraged. You can get me off onto something else. I remember uh, uh, back in, oh, I guess it was the uh, late, eight, mid-80s. Uh, many preachers, uh, fundamental, independent Baptist preachers, resign in their pulpits to get involved in politics. And I, I don't think there's a problem with the Christian being involved in politics. I mean, uh, I mean God ordained government, and, and we ought to take an active role in being influenced there. But I remember some preachers getting so involved in politics that they, they lost their churches. They lost their ministry. Now, the moral majority, I think it was probably a good thing. I don't know it as well. I was just a teenager, and some of you older men may remember it and know more about it than I do. But it had a, 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 a good philosophy to it, I guess. But listen, what happened is there are some preachers that got distracted uh, about a good thing, and they forgot the main thing, forgot about soul winning, forgot about preaching the gospel, so listen, the, the devil, he, he's out to render you ineffective. He doesn't want you to serve God. <clears throat> listen, the devil, uh, uh, he took away everything Job had, even affected his health. Okay? God allowed him to do that. But aren't you glad that Joseph just kept, or not Joseph, Job just kept on serving God? Aren't you just glad he kept serving God? But man, nowadays, 
Well, we get a hangnail. Oh, my, I don't think I don't think I go to church. I've got this hangnail, and oh my goodness. Hey, you know what? The devil done one with you, didn't he? Or, or, or um, somebody disagrees with us, or we find out that they were talking bad about us. Well, I can't go to church anymore. Hey, the, uh, listen, the devil just got a victory right there. The Bible talks about how that we shouldn't be at division with each other because then the devil, uh, Satan, he gets an advantage over us. Listen, <clears throat> number one, there is a warfare. There is a warfare. Listen, there are uh, demonic forces out there. And once again, you don't, I'm not saying you ought to go around looking, boy, you go in the house, boy, I wonder if there's one under the couch and I, probably one laying on the couch. And I, I wonder if there's one in the cupboard. Listen, I'm not talking about being spooky, but the devil is out plotting, trying to get you to not serve God. And you, by the way, you can't escape the fact that there is a spiritual warfare. Luke 22, 31 says this, Jesus said, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He said, uh, uh, Peter or Simon, the devil has desired to have you. He wants to tear you to shreds. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren <coughs> that are in the world. So here, once again, the Bible says that the devil, he's stalking around as a roaring lion. He's looking for someone to devour. You can't escape that. If you are a child of God, he is your bitter enemy. And he wants to render you useless for the work of the Lord. Now listen, you've got two choices here. <coughs> I remember a teenager one time, uh, he, he said, uh, Brother Ronnie, I don't think I want to live for God. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, I, I hear all these preachers saying that if you live for God, the devil's really going to battle you. And if you live for God, he's going to uh, really, I mean, you, you get the target painted on you, and I don't want a target. I want the devil to leave me alone. I think I'm just not going to, you know, uh, try to <clears throat> pursue this thing of living for God. You have two choices. You can do what that young man was thinking and, and what he has done. Romans 6, 16, you, you can give in to the enemy. You can just give in. You can just surrender. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So you can have that philosophy. Boy, I tell you what, I'm just tired of the fight. I'm not going to fight. I just give in. Or you can have another attitude. You can fight. I mean, it is a war, right? You can fight. Once we have, uh, uh, listen to this, Ernest Hemingway said this, once we have a war, there is only one thing to do. It must be won. Okay? For defeat brings worse things than any, uh, than any that, okay. For defeat brings worse things than any that can ever happen in a war. So he said, it, when a war comes, here's one thing to do, just win the war. Because if you lose the war, if you just give in and roll over, you become servant, you become the slave of the one that defeated you, and worse things happen than is actually happening in the war. Now look, you roll over and let the devil have control, and you give up and say, well, I know this is wrong, but I'm just going to give in and do it. I'm tired of the fight. Listen, worse things await you. Hey, you think the devil has your best interest in mind? No. Do you think he just, he's going to stop right there? You take one step out of the will of God, you think he's going to stop right there? No, he's going to lead you further and further down that path. You've heard preachers say it, that sin will take you further than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and make you pay far more than you were ever willing to pay. How does it happen? One step at a time. If the devil can say, hey, uh, we was out there fishing. Boy, got some... Uh, uh, some squid, some of that squid, and we cut that squid, we throw it on, the, on them hooks, and we throw that out there. Got some cut bait, we threw some cut bait out there. And uh, what was that to do? When those fish were uh, swimming by, it was to get them to turn their head. One of the tour group, the Grace Baptist tour group, had come back through, and, and I took them out there fishing with me, and one of the guys caught a shark, a sand shark, just a small one. He's about that long, and you could hold him like this. You know where he caught him? In the stomach. It didn't even, didn't even bite the hook. What had he had done? He had swam so, he, he saw that squid and he swam up too close to it is what he did and he got hooked and that's exactly what the devil will do with you. 
<clears throat> now, the reason I'm preaching this is it's summertime, folks. It's summertime, summertime, some, some. That, dedicate that to Miss Perry there. Listen, many times in the summer, good Christians get distracted. They get out of routine. They get involved in things that they ought not get involved in. And before you know it, their life is in ruin. <clears throat> Let me read another verse here. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. So you can just give in and say, I'm just so tired of fighting. Boy, I'm glad our young men in, in uh, Germany, World War II, just didn't say, well, I'm too tired. I'm glad that our young men in the, in the South Pacific didn't just give in and say, I'm too tired. I'm worn out. I'm just giving up. Take me to prison camp. <clears throat> I, I know one, uh, uh, one general, I forget which one it was, but he said, and, um, uh, after, after this war, the only Japanese being spoke is going to be spoken in hell. In other words, he was saying, we're going to kill them all. Okay? What was he saying? I'm not giving up, is what he was saying. He said, I'm going to fight. Now you have a choice. In this spiritual warfare, you can either determine, okay, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to do whatever comes natural to me. I'm not going to fight. Or you can determine, hey, bless God, I'm going to fight. And I'm going to see this thing through, and, and no matter how hard it gets, and, and it, I'm just going to fight. I'm just going to do right. Pastor, do you ever get discouraged? Yes, I sure do. What do you do? I just try to keep doing right. Pastor, you ever feel like not coming to church? Yes, there's time. I got a headache right now. Uh, it feels like one of those that you get when you don't eat much. But I've been eating. I think I just need to eat more. And uh, But, you know, I just come on to church anyways. Hey, just do right. Just do right. You don't understand, Pastor. It's hard. Hey, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Hey, just stay in there and determine I'm going to fight. <clears throat> There's a, 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 a lieutenant colonel named Lewis Puller, his nickname Lewis Chesty uh, Puller because he is a big barrel chested man and just a, as tough as nails. He said this right here, he said uh, when he was calling in, he was contacting his commanding officers, he said, uh, all right, they're on, my, uh, they're on our left, they're talking about the enemy, he said they're on our left, they're on our right, they're in front of us, they're behind us, they can't get away this time. He radioed in another time and he said, We're, or, we have been searching for the enemy for days. We are now surrounded. That solves the problem of finding them. Hey, his unit was one of the most decorated units of all time. Why? Because he said, listen, there's a battle going on out there and my goodness, I am not giving in. I'm going to fight. I read some of him where uh, he would just, he, he encountered the enemy up on a hill. What did he do? Charge. Let's go. One general said to his soldiers, he said, let's charge. What do y'all want to live forever? So we're going to die sometime. Let's die charging. And they overcame the enemy. Now listen, the devil desires to sift you. He desires to ruin your marriage. He desires to ruin the relationship between you and your parents and parents between you and your children. He desires to get you out of church. He desires to stop you from soul winning. He desires to stop you from reading your Bible. He desires to stop you from praying. He desires to stop you from memorizing the scripture. He desires you uh, to stop you from having a good attitude. He desires to stop you from being honest. He desires to stop you from being a hard worker. He desires to stop you from being faithful. The devil is out to get you. What are you going to do? Just roll over and let him win? Fight. The good fight. The enemy, not only there is a warfare, but the enemy is subtle. He's slick. John F. Kennedy said this. He said, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, unrealistic. Satan used this tactic on Eve. He didn't just come out and say, Hey, Eve, bite that fruit, take a bite of that fruit, and man, all your wildest dreams will come true and, and you will be able to create worlds. And all. No, he was a little more subtle than that. He said, hath God said? 
Hey, did, did he really say that? Hey, Eve, is, is that what he really meant? You don't think God meant not to. It, and she said, oh, he said not even touch it. Oh, is that really what he meant, Eve? I mean, look at that fruit. Looks like it's pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. He said, what's the name of this tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why? I guess that fruit makes you wise. Now, what was he doing? He was ever so subtly attracting her to it. He wasn't being bombastic and, and, and showing all the end result ever so subtly. Hey, look, it's probably a good thing, Eve. Look, it's just fruit. What could be wrong with a piece of fruit? It's just a tree. What could be wrong with just a tree? God lets you eat of all the other trees. Why not this one? Listen, the enemy is subtle. He's not going to come up to you with this plan and put in your mind, hey, why don't you do such and such? It will ruin your life. No, he's just going to try to get a little hook in you. Just a little hook. When I go fishing out on the salt water, I like to use, there's all kinds of hooks you can use. The kind of hook I like to use is called a kale hook. Any of you guys know what a kale hook is? A kale hook, you know what a circle hook is? Well, it's not one of those, okay? You know what a J hook is? It's not one of those. A kale hook has a long swooping hook that comes back. That thing is designed, you don't even have to set the hook when they bite. All they've got to do is put their mouth on it. And all, then when they do, just start reeling. That hook is designed when that fish takes that uh, hook into its mouth and they bite and they start to swim, you feel that little tug, you just start reeling. It slides back into the corner of their mouth and hooks in right there. Doesn't take a big kale hook as long as they'll bite it. And if I can get that fish <clears throat> to bite on that hook, he's mine, folks. He's coming in. I'm going to turn his head towards me, and it's not going to turn the other way. Why? Because I got my hook in him. That's exactly what the devil wants to do with you. Listen, you sit down on the Internet, well, there's some good things on the Internet, but it's also one of the most dangerous things in the world you can mess with. It's just as dangerous as a rattlesnake. You sit down there in the wee hours of the morning, late at night. You sit down and you go into some stinking chat room, and it's innocent speech, talking. Next thing you know, fellas, you, hey, you're a married man, and now you're chatting with some lady. And she begins to give you a sob story. Or maybe, ladies, you're chatting to some man. And you feel like you can vent to him. You can tell him your problems. I mean, after all, he lives on the other side of America. Hey, you know what's happening? Satan's getting that hook in you. And after a while, that person on the other end, you never even met him. And they begin to tell you all kind, give you these visions of grandeur. Next thing you know, you leave your, your family and your, your spouse and your children. Pastor, that never happened to me. I personally know of people that's happened with. Personally, hey, uh, uh, this lady that worked at the church I was at for, for several years, her husband met somebody online, left his wife and children. What happened? What happened? He didn't get the idea one day, everything's going good, and hey, you know what, I think I'll start talking to some other lady and just ruin my family. No, he just ever so subtly. Listen to this, the enemy is subtle and the enemy is strong. 1 Samuel 17, 33, and by the way, he's stronger than you are. You hear people sometimes say, boy, I wish I could see the devil. I tell you, I'd let him have it. No, I tell you what, if I saw the devil, I'd run the other way. So I'd run and get behind uh, Brother Gallahue over here. He's bigger than I am. <laughs> I'd say, he said it, not me. I take off running. Hey, listen, the enemy's stronger than you are. 1 Samuel 17, 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Now listen, David ended up winning, but really, if you look at it, David was really no match for Goliath by himself. David, on his own, was no match for Goliath. And if you read that story of David, David didn't just go up and say, Hey, listen to what I can do. I can do this. No, he said, with the Lord's help, I can do this. I can't do it on my own. 
Hey, the Lord helped me kill the lion. The Lord helped me kill a bear. But that, that's a giant out there. And I tell you what, uh, I, I'm not going with him by myself. I'm going at him with the Lord's help. And he ended up winning. But uh, he, he, in all actuality, was no, no match for Goliath. He had to have the Lord. In Numbers 13, 33, in there, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which, were, uh, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight, the children of Israel. They're spying out the land. They see the enemy. And listen, the children of Israel in and of themselves were no match for the enemy. They were all giants just like Goliath. They, he said, they said, hey, in our own sight when we looked at them, we felt like grasshoppers. And when they looked down at us, we looked like grasshoppers. They were no match. Now, ten of the men came back. They realized we're no match, but they left God out of the equation. We can't do it. Two men came back, Joshua and Caleb, and they said, they're right. There's giants over there. The cities are high and walled. That's right. We can't do it. But, hey, let's go over anyways because God's already promised that he would. Now, listen, we have a strong enemy. And you get to tiptoeing around sin this summer, or any time actually, you get to tiptoeing around it, and listen, you think, I, hey, I know my boundaries. Let me tell you something about the boundaries. You get close enough, you'll cross them. You will cross, you get close enough to that boundary you've drawn, and you will clo- uh, cross it. Hey man, draw yourself a boundary, and then get far away from the boundary. Why? Because I, I'll be tempted to cl- uh, cross that boundary. If I see a line that says, do not cross, I won't. Look, I really do. I just want to put a toe across it. What's that sin nature in me? I heard about this, this uh, police officer pulled over a guy, and, and the guy kept talking and moving around. He wouldn't be, stay put. And, and so uh, uh, anybody in here Polish? You don't mind Polak jokes, do you? I hope not. I, are you, brother? I, well, I figured. Uh, <clears throat> the police officer drew a circle on the ground. He said, you stand in that circle right there. The guy stood in the circle. Police officer went over and he began to write a ticket and he heard the guy laugh and he turned around. What's so funny? He turned back around writing that ticket. Don't step out of that circle. I'll put you in jail. You step out of that circle. He didn't write. Guy starts laughing. He looks back. The guy's just standing there. What you doing? What's wrong? Goes back a third time. He hears the guy laughing. What is so funny? He said, while you weren't looking, I stepped out of that circle three times. Hey, you draw yourself a boundary, you get close to that boundary, you're going to cross it. Realize that the devil, he's powerful. This world is powerful. Look, <clears throat> I went down to the coast to fish. Now, I, I pers- now this is a personal conviction of mine, okay? You do it, it's, it's your business. I don't go on the beach in the he- heat of the day. Why? Really, do I have to explain this? Men, I mean, men, you, you, you understand, right? You understand where I'm coming from? There's ladies out there that are scantily clad. Don't you love your wife? Oh, yeah, she's the most beautiful lady in the world. But I'm a, I'm a man. And I, I, I'm going to look really stupid walking around like this. So I've determined I'll not go out there. In the heat. I go out either early in the morning, late in the evening when nobody's there. Why? Because, because the enemy is subtle. And the enemy is powerful. And, boy, he, stu- he studies you. And he knows your weak points probably better than you know them yourself. <clears throat> In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, Paul said this, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul was saying, when I realize how powerful the world is and how powerful the devil is and how powerful this flesh is, when I realize their strength and my weakness, then I'm at my strongest. How can that be, Paul? Because Paul would say, because now I'm relying on the Lord. When David saw the giant and he said, whoa, boy, that's one mighty big fella. I better include the Lord in on this one. When the children of Israel saw the giants, they said, boy, those are giants. And Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, but they're nothing for the Lord to handle. Now Paul's saying, listen, there's a, there's a, a warfare. There's an enemy out to destroy me, and he's going to try to destroy you, going to try to get you off track. Listen, I've already seen it happen with some. Some are just barely getting started, and I already see some just drifting off following some little lure that the devil reels by you. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. He's strong. He's trying to destroy you. If he can get you to take one step, just one step, he might be able to get you to take another one. We need to realize the need to be armed. 
It's a battle. It's a battle. The Christian must be armed in order to face the conflict with unbelief, worldliness, and immorality. And listen, the, our, our nation is running rampant with immorality. It's running rampant. It's running rampant with worldliness. And by the way, listen, young person. Oh, there's not many in here. Uh, well, listen, all of you. <clears throat> this is the wrong philosophy here. We get as close to as we can to the line and say, well, this isn't really sin. Okay? And it may not be. But you're disarming yourself. You're disarming yourself. <clears throat> Hey, you need to have the attitude, I don't want to get anywhere close to the world. By the way, those that do, those who yield to the Lord in that way and say, I want to get as far from the world as I can, you'll, you'll see it in their spirit a lot more. They won't be near so defiant. They'll have a sweeter spirit. They'll have a, a more pleasant countenance. Not how much can I do and it not be sin, but boy, Lord, I don't want to get anywhere close to it. If it's sin, I don't want to be close to it. There's a need to be armed. Unarmed, you will not face temptation and win. What do you mean by armed? Well, the Bible talks there about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit. Hey, and we'll go over those things in weeks to come. Listen, you need to be armed. This is a battle. One way you learn to use that armor and one way you learn to use those weapons is coming to the house of God, hear the preaching, hear the Sunday school teaching. Hey, another way you learn to use it, get alone with God by yourself. By yourself, get alone with Him. Many a Christian has gone into battle unprepared and fallen shamefully. <clears throat> Read a book, uh, Growing Up in Vietnam, by Tom Vogel. <clears throat> he speaks of how, man, when you went out there, you always wore your helmet. Now, I wasn't in Vietnam. Some of you were. They found a fella that had been posted as kind of a lookout or whatever. and He had been posted over near the river. He was to, to kind of uh, stand guard and let people know if something was coming. They heard one shot. They went and found him dead. He was down at the river. His helmet was left behind where everything else was. A sniper shot him in the head. What happened? He was thirsty. Went down to get some water in his canteen. And he got killed. Why he let his guard down? Don't let your guard down. <clears throat> Sir, you guard yourself. Ma'am, you guard yourself. And by the way, guard your children. Guard your children. Armor, by the way, this armor must be divine. In other words, it must be provided by God. That's where you're going to get it. You'll not make it. You'll not make it, and you'll not win the war with just having the attitude, well, I'm going to do right. No, you better be clothed in the righteousness of God. You better be dressed in his armor. <clears throat> A breastplate, uh, uh, listen, that armor must be godlike. A breastplate is no protection against a poison cup. Did you realize that? I, mean, I can put all kinds of armor on, but you give me a cup full of poison, and I drink it, it's going to kill me. The, the weapons uh, of the devil and the flesh, they're not physical weapons. They're spiritual weapons. Therefore, you better have a spiritual armor. And once again, we'll go through that. The armor and the weapons must be spiritual in nature. Hey, and not only that, here's the last thing. You've got to wear the whole armor. You've got to wear it all. That helmet, that breastplate, that shield, loins girt about with the truth, feet shot with the preparation of the gospel, holding the sword of the Spirit. Listen, what I'm simply trying to say is there is a battle out there and you will lose if you're running from God. And you will lose if you're not walking with God. He's seeking to destroy you. Well, I've got it under control, you say. Boy, you're playing right into the devil's hand. Yeah, he won't. You're not the one that needs to have it under control. Let Jesus Christ have control. Hey, look, when you have control, there's going to be problems. Hey, you get up in an airplane next time. And, and let's say that uh, uh, the, the pilot gets sick. He passes out. And the co-pilot, everybody in the cockpit passes out. And they come to you, Brother Steve. They say, we need somebody to fly this plane. And you go up there and you say, hey, no problem. And you grab the, that whatever steering wheel stick, whatever. You grab it and you say, hey, I've got this under control. Now, if I'm on that plane, I'm, I'm going to take my chances bailing out without a parachute. Okay. Well, Brother Steve having it under control, some 747 is not going to comfort me. 
But if the pilot has it under control, then I'm fine. You have the attitude, well, I've got this under control. I know my limits. I know my boundaries. I'm doing fine. Look, I'm just, I'm not in sin. I'm just kind of tiptoeing around it. I'm just playing with it a little bit. And, and look, I'll, I'll be okay. Look at me. Boy, I've got it under control. Listen, that's exactly where the devil wants you. How many of you in here like to watch boxing? Any of you guys like to watch boxing? You like that? I, I like to watch boxing. I like MMA, uh, that uh, mixed martial. I, I like that kind of stuff. Here's what I really love. This guy's winning, and he starts showboating. He puts his hands down here, starts doing stuff with his feet. He's doing like this and reach up, tag the guy. He's just showboating. You know why? He has it under control. Now, I've seen this before. Out of nowhere, this other guy is now to the point of he's about punch drunk. He's staggering. Referee hadn't called it yet. You ever seen this, guys? And he just takes a swing. Nothing orthodox about it. I mean, just swings, body weight, hits the guy on the chin that's doing all the footwork and knocks him out. The whole time, the guy doing the, the footwork and showboating his manager saying, finish it, finish it, stop dancing, put up your guard, put up your guard. And that guy that's about out of it, he's seeing three, he's going to aim at the one in the middle, and he swings his arm and knocks him out. Now listen, you go ahead and you, you think, well, I've got it under control. I can handle this. When you least expect it, devil's going to throw a haymaker on you. He's going to knock you down for the count. And you're going to wake up seeing stars thinking, how in the world did I get here? Folks, simply as the introduction to our series, I'm going to encourage you, fight a good fight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us.